going to talk about spectral universality in high dimensional estimation. Uh, he's, uh, he's in Harvard, but then uh, be going to become a faculty very soon at Meriton. universality in high dimensional estimation. Um, one thing I'll say is that my slides are probably going to be messed up because I should have converted into PDF before transferring, but I didn't. So uh, let's see. So let me uh, begin by introducing a canonical estimation problem. Uh, so uh, maybe a very simple task is to fit a generalized linear model to a data set or alternatively to recover an unknown signal from noisy nonlinear measurements. And so maybe one way of formalizing this problem is that there is this unknown signal vector beta star, which is a p-dimensional vector that we would like to estimate. Uh, and we observe a measurement vector y. Uh, this is an n-dimensional vector. Um, and the way we uh, model the uh, uh, relationship between y and beta star is by a generalized linear model. So it's composed of two steps. So first you transform the signal linearly, and this linear transformation is given by a design matrix X. Uh, and you might, depending on uh, which area you work in, you might also call it the feature matrix, or the me measurement matrix, or the sensing matrix. And then there's this uh, uh, nonlinearity G, which acts entry-wise on the linear transformation of the signal. Um, and you might want to allow some noise in the measurement process, so there's an epsilon there. And so maybe throughout this talk, I'll use n to denote the sample size or the number of measurements, and p to denote the dimension of the signal that we would like to estimate. Uh, so this talk is going to be about high dimensional asymptotics or pre precise asymptotics or proportional asymptotics. And here the goal is sort of to study this problem when we let both the number of measurements n and p, which is the dimension of the signal, go to uh, uh, infinity together such that their ratio converges to a fixed constant delta. And uh, I guess uh, there are a lot of people who worked, uh, uh, who work in this sort of regime, and maybe I took a shortcut and I just put a reference to a review article I like. So, uh, um, and really maybe the, uh, the reason why we study this problems in this asymptotic is that in this asymptotic we can uh, precisely characterize uh, the error of our estimators including the constants. And so um, uh, uh, in many situations, we can come up with many estimators which get the correct um, order of magnitude of the error bound. And here, the then the promise of this proportional asymptotics is that by analyzing problems in this regime, you can uh, pin down the exact constants and compare uh, different estimators which tend to be equivalent in terms of the order of magnitude of the error bounds. Um, and so if you... Uh, read papers in this area, you will often see uh, figures like this, where people plot um, uh, the theorems that prove, which are the green curves, with the simulations, empirical simulations that they do, which are the black dots. And the point that people are trying to make with this is that in this sort of asymptotic, um, uh, you're not getting coarse performance bounds. You're exactly get, in describing the exact performance of the estimator, including the sharp constant. Um, but uh, the, maybe one of the uh, issues here is that if we, when we do the analysis in this sort of asymptotic regime, we typically tend to make strong assumptions on the design matrix X. So maybe popular assumptions are the design matrix is Gaussian, the design matrix is IID, um, or rotationally invariant. And maybe the simplest uh, assumption you can make is that uh, the design matrix has IID Gaussian entries. Um, and so this talk is going to about uh, what can how can we do proportional asymptotics without making these strong distributional assumptions. Um, so, um, <clears throat> so like the motivation uh, for this talk is coming from signal processing applications. So I'll tell you what design matrices look like in uh, signal processing applications. So in uh, compressed sensing, which is sort of the uh, mathematical problem underlying MRI machines, um, uh, it turns out that the design matrix, uh, the way it's constructed, is that you take a big DFT matrix, a discrete Fourier transform matrix, and you randomly pick some rows of it. Um, and uh, in uh, imaging applications like X-ray crystallography, the, uh, uh, the design matrix has the structure, it consists of several blocks, and each block is a Fourier matrix uh, multiplied by a diagonal matrix. 
So exact, I, I'll talk about these matrices again later in the talk, maybe so it's not important how do they show up right now, but what I want to uh, tell you is that these matrices, these design matrices are very far from Gaussian designs, right? Um, and so this talk is going to be how can we do sort of proportional asymptotics when our design matrix is non-Gaussian, has strong dependence, and uh, very little randomness in it. Uh, okay. Okay, so let me, uh, so, so the reason why there's this hope of doing, um, uh, uh, proving any results uh, for these designs is this sort of empirical phenomenon called spectral, you know, which we call spectral universality because we didn't have a name for it. And um, uh, to explain this phenomenon, again, keep, keep in mind the problem of uh, fitting a generalized linear model to your data. And so if someone gives you a design matrix, you can specify it by its SVD. So the U's are the left singular vectors, uh, the sigma is a diagonal matrix consisting of the singular values, and the V are the right singular vectors. And what uh, people have often observed is that the statistical, problem, uh, the statistical properties of the inference problems somehow often depend only on the singular values of your design matrix X. The singular vectors themselves are not super important, provided that they are not exceptional singular vectors. Um, and by statistical performance, I mean statistical properties, I just mean the performance of your favorite uh, algorithm to solve this problem. Um, and there's like a long line of work which sort of has observed this in simulation. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so, uh, so, so why, why is this interesting? Because it sort of gives us a way to simplify our problem. So uh, maybe we care about an actual design X, uh, which we kind of don't know how to do proportional asymptotics for. This design might be very deterministic. Uh, it might have strong dependence between its entries. But if you sort of believe in this uh, spectral universality phenomenon, what you could do is that you could construct a surrogate design. Um, uh, which will uh, capture the behavior of the design that you care about. And the way this surrogate design is constructed is that you preserve the spectrum of your original design. So X and X still share the same singular values. So the sigma, which is in magenta, is, is the same for the two designs. But you, uh, uh, in, by constructing your surrogate design, you, uh, uh, you uh, sample the left and right singular vectors as uniformly random orthogonal matrices. Uh, and maybe the reason to do so is that this is the most mathematically convenient distribution for your singular vectors. Um, and so if the singular vectors don't matter, then you might as well as assume them to be uh, what is easiest to work with, right? Uh, and once you uh, make this uh, assumption, it often turns out that the, it's possible to do high dimensional asymptotics for this surrogate design because of the rotational invariance properties of the uniform distribution on the orthogonal group. Uh, and what is surprising is that uh, even though uh, people can prove theorems about the surrogate design, the theorems that they prove often describe the behavior of the actual design that you started with. And so this, this is called, uh, this is what we call as spectral universality. Uh, so let me see if, uh, so I'll give an example uh, of this, but uh, let me pause and see if there, there's any question about the basic idea. Okay. Uh, so the, what I want to, so this is, uh, uh, so what I want to, uh, uh, the reason why I call this a heuristic is because there's this uh, phrase in the, in the heuristic, it says that the singular vectors are not important provided that they're not exceptional. So there's a requirement that these uh, singular vectors are generic, but I'm not really telling you what this is. And this is, so we do, right now the way I've stated, we don't know when is this gonna work and when is this not gonna work. And so that's why I call it a heuristic. Okay. Um, so here's the outline of, uh, of my talk. Um, oh, okay, sorry. Uh, so here's the uh, outline of my talk. So uh, I'll begin by, uh, so I've already told you what the phenomenon is that we want to understand, which is uh, a spectral universality. Um, and uh, uh, so now I'm going to the second part of the talk, which where the goal is to sort of give you an example of why this is a, like an important uh, thing to try and understand and what you can do uh, by exploiting this uh, phenomenon. And to, the last part of the talk will be towards uh, 
uh, trying to uh, 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 bring this heuristic principle into like a mathematical framework, a formal mathematical uh, statement. Okay, so uh, uh, so uh, so uh, I, so 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 in the second part of the talk, I'll ex explain an application of what you can do with this empirically observed phenomenon in the context of a problem called phase retrieval, uh, which we already saw in uh, Marco's talk. Um, and basically, the philosophy uh, is uh, that uh, in this problem, the design matrix are quite hard to understand. And instead, uh, uh, instead, uh, so rather than, sorry, uh, are quite hard to understand. And so rather than uh, trying to understand those, uh, we'll uh, construct these surrogate designs for this problem using this spectral universality heuristic. And um, uh, the hope is that the two designs, the surrogate design and the design that we care about, lie in the same universality class. And uh, for the purpose of the second part of the talk, we'll just settle with checking this in simulations. And the hope is that whatever insights that we get out of analyzing the easier problem, which, is this, which are the surrogate designs, will tr uh, transfer to the uh, designs that we really care about. So that's going to be the rough overview of the second part of the talk. So let me begin by uh, introducing this problem, which is the phase retrieval problem. So this uh, problem arises in uh, imaging applications. So here, uh, you basically want to uh, figure out the structure of a molecule. So what you do is that you uh, place a sample of the molecule in front of an X-ray source. And as the X-rays pass through the molecule, they diffract. And then you capture a diffraction pattern on, the, on your sensor. Um, and basically because of physical limitations, you can only, uh, the diffraction pattern has both like a magnitude and a phase information, but you can only measure the magnitude of the diffraction pattern because of some physical limitations. Uh, and uh, so you sort of, you can map this problem into the problem of fitting a generalized linear model. So here, uh, the measurements are the diffraction patterns that you observe uh, in, on your sensor. Uh, the beta star, which is the unknown signal, represents sort of the structure of the molecule that you want to uh, infer. Uh, and sort of the physics of the problem is encoded in the design matrix X for this problem. And because um, you are not observing, you're only observing the intensity of the diffraction pattern, you're losing the phase information, um, uh, the measurements are the squared absolute value of the linear measurements. Uh, so this square absolute value acts entry-wise on its arguments. Um, and uh, what we would like to do for this problem is to construct an estimator which recovers the unknown signal beta star uh, using the things that we observe. So the measurements and the design matrix which we know because we understand the physics of this problem. Um, and once we have an estimator, we assess how well it's doing by measuring the uh, cosine similarity between the uh, 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 between the signal and the estimator. So if this is close to one, it means that we are doing great. And if it's close to zero, it means that we are doing pretty badly. So uh, what's, uh, what does the design matrix look like in this problem? So I mentioned this design matrix briefly, but I'll sort of explain it again, and I'll tell you how this design matrix is showing up. So the design matrix in this problem consists of several blocks and each block is a Fourier matrix multiplied with a diagonal matrix. So um, why does the Fourier matrix show up? It shows up because of the physics of the problem. The diffraction pattern that is captured on the photographic, uh, on the sensor, is the Fourier transform of the electron density function of the signal. So that's why the Fourier matrix shows up in this design matrix. So why do these random diagonal matrices show up? Uh, so one of the proposals uh, for this problem by Candace et al. is to um, is that you would like to capture redundant information about your signal. So you want to repeat your experiment several times. And each time you want to illuminate your uh, unknown molecule in different ways to uh, capture redundant information. So these, uh, uh, these diagonal matrices sort of represent um, uh, sort of masks that you use to randomly illuminate your molecule to capture more information. Um, and again, the main uh, quantity of, 
uh, interest, uh, the main uh, parameter for this problem is going to be the sampling ratio n by p, which is the ratio of the number of measurements. So that's the number of rows in the design matrix to p, which is the dimension of the unknown signal that we want to estimate. Okay, uh, um, is the setup okay? Um, okay, so uh, uh, so uh, so uh, uh, so one sort of there, there are many different estimators for this problem, and uh, one sort of uh, one class of popular estimators are to run PCA somehow reduce the problem into running PCA, um, and uh, so here the uh, idea is that the way you're going to um, estimate your unknown signal beta star is by computing the largest eigenvector of a reweighted covariance matrix of your design matrix. So this m tau is, you can just think of it as uh, the a covariance matrix corresponding to your design matrix, except that you have these weights, uh, which are uh, constructed by uh, transforming the measurements by i's. So you're weighting your, the rows of your design matrices um, by the corresponding measurements. Uh, and then you're not using the measurements as it is, but you are sort of transforming them before using them. And uh, this transformation is something that you, you should choose to optimize, the, to get the best possible performance. So it's like a user-defined tuning parameter, and you should try to figure out a tau which would give you the best uh, reconstruction. Uh, the nice thing about this estimator is really simple, right? So you're just running PCA on a weighted covariance matrix. So it's really simple to compute. And as we'll see, and as we, all of, we already saw in Marco's talk, that often uh, the spectral estimator is optimal in some ways. And even if you want to use a more complicated estimator, like running gradient descent on some sort of uh, loss function for this problem, you could, that loss function is more often than not uh, non-convex, so you could consider initializing your algorithm with the spectral estimator. Uh, and so in the plot on the right, I'm plotting the performance of the spectral estimator as I change the n by p ratio, so the number of measurements to the dimension of the signal. Um, uh, and I'm measuring the performance of the spectral estimator by the uh, uh, squared cosine similarity between the estimator and the, um, and the, uh, and the unknown signal. Um, and so as you can imagine, as you get more and more measurements, the spectral estimator becomes better and better. And I'm using two different choices <laughs> of data. Uh, <laughs> I'm using two different choices of tau. So that's the trimming function or the transformation you're using to transform your measurements before using them in the uh, spectral estimator. And as you can see, that the choice of the trimming function can can change the performance of the spectral estimator by quite a bit. So we would like to understand how, how do we come up with good trimming functions for this problem. And let me quickly tell you some prior work um, uh, for this problem. Um, so for the mass Fourier, so these plots are for the mass Fourier matrices. And for the mass Fourier ma matrices, people have done sort of a uh, order of magnitude analysis of how many samples, what's the order of magnitude of samples that you need for the spectral estimator to work for this very structured matrix, matrix so that's Candice, uh, the work by Candice et al. Um, uh, but what's been missing is the sort of the high dimensional analysis, the precise analysis when we let both n and p go to infinity such that the ratio converges to a constant. Um, and in sort of that sort of line of work, people have uh, settled for un understanding um, the spectral estimator when the design is IID Gaussian. Uh, but the point is that IID Gaussian uh, designs don't really capture the mass Fourier designs which are important for this problem. Uh, and uh, mainly the key difficulty in uh, sort of analyzing the mass Fourier designs is that these designs are quite structured and they're really hard to analyze directly. <coughs> okay. So, uh, so, so this is sort of exactly the problem in which we should try to apply the spectral universality principle that I told you about in the, uh, in the first part of the talk. And I'll just recall, so it says that uh, only the singular values of your design should matter. The singular vectors might not matter if they are, unless they are very exceptional. And so the actual design that we care about is the mass for your design. It's very structured, very little randomness, and we don't know how to analyze this. But 
it turns out you can write down it's SVD. Uh, and uh, we'll consider a surrogate design. So I'll call that design the hard design. And the way it's constructed is by preserving the singular values of the mass Fourier design by thinking of the singular vectors of the design that we uh, as random orthogonal matrices. So you preserve the uh, uh, singular values because singular values are supposed to be important, but the singular vectors are not, so you might as well as assume that they are random orthogonal matrices. Um, and again, we choose random orthogonal uh, matrices because they are easy to work with. Uh, and maybe the hope is that uh, by making this strong assumption, uh, the problem becomes more tractable. But at the same time, because we are preserving the spectrum, uh, maybe we can still expect some universality. So the results proof for the hard design would describe what's happening for the actual design that we care about. So, um, uh, so let me... Uh, uh, tell you about a result that we proved. Uh, so this is uh, work I did during my PhD with my advisor, Aryan Maliki, and a fellow student, Milad, and a postdoc, Junji. Um, and um, uh, so, so basically, we uh, uh, characterized the performance of spectral estimators in the proportional regime. Uh, and as you can imagine, the, uh, the limiting performance has a complicated formula. So I haven't tried to written, write it down completely, but what I've sort of highlighted is sort of the main feature of the formula, that there's sort of a critical threshold, uh, which is delta critical, um, below which the uh, spectral estimator is, uh, the uh, accuracy of the spectral estimator converges to zero, so it's not doing anything useful. But, and then above the critical con uh, threshold, it converges to uh, um, uh, uh, um, like a, uh, an explicit function, which I'm calling rho. I haven't written down the formula for rho because it's complicated. Um, and again, so as I mentioned, the, the, the result is proved in the high dimensional limit when you let both n and p go to infinity, such that the ratio converges to a constant delta. Um, the explicit formula is messy, so I've just told you the main feature of the formula. And what I want to say is that, so the spectral estimator had a tuning parameter tau, which was the trimming function, and the limiting performance depends on tau. So both the critical threshold uh, delta crit and the uh, limiting accuracy above the critical threshold depend are explicit functions, which depend on the trimming function tau that you, you decided to use. Um, and so in the plot on the left, I am uh, the, the, uh, the black dots are again the performance of the spectral estimator on the mass Fourier design, which is the actual design for the problem that we care about. Um, and the, uh, uh, the, the green curves are the results of this theorem. So even though the theorem was proved for the hard design, um, what this plot is showing you is that really the same result seems to hold for even for the mass Fourier design. So that's like a universal, an instance of the spectral universality because we preserved uh, in doing our analysis, we preserved the singular values of the mass Fourier design. The result we got by randomizing the singular vectors actually describes what's happening for the design that we care about. And maybe I'll say one word about the proof. Uh, the, sort of the proof involves sort of massaging the problem into a well-studied matrix model in, in free probability. Um, okay, let me pause for a second and see if there are questions. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, yeah. So, so what can you, you do with this result? So it turns out that um, uh, because we understand the uh, performance of uh, spectral estimators for a wide range of trimming functions, what you could use the, pro the theorem statement to do is to figure out what the optimal choice of the uh, uh, trimming function is. So just like, like in the Gaussian case, uh, so I had alluded to work before, uh, where people first analyzed the problem uh, for the Gaussian design, and they were able to use that result to optimize, to figure out the optimal uh, trimming function. It turns out you can do the same for the hard design, and the optimal trimming function is like a very explicit function. I've written it down. Um, and uh, the 
in the figure. So the two curves are the trimming function. The two curves on the bottom are the trimming functions that I've been showing you, and the curve on the top is this optimal trimming function that you get by optimizing over tau. And so, as you can imagine, that it beats uh, the other two uh, trimming functions. Otherwise, it wouldn't be optimal. Um, and the way this optimal trimming function is derived is by solving a variational problem, right? So for any uh, tau, we understand what the limiting performance is. So we want to solve the variational problem of, of finding the, the best tau. And um, turns out that this problem has some nice st un uh, analytic structure in underneath it. So you can figure out uh, what the optimal tau is uh, explicitly. Um, and maybe one uh, feature of the optimal trimming function is that when delta is less than two, even the optimal trimming function is not working at all. So you can see the, uh, its accuracy is again, uh, is, is basically zero. Uh, and actually we know, we also know that uh, this is not really something to do with the spectral estimator, but that, but when delta is less than two, nothing is gonna work. So the problem is just information theoretically impossible when delta is less than two. So this is why I was suggesting that in some sense, spectral estimators are optimal. <coughs> okay. Uh, then I will, uh, I'll see if there are any questions and then I'll move to the. Right, uh, yeah, that's true. Um, so, uh, yeah, and maybe you'll see, like, uh, yeah, so like for certain bad uh, beta star, uh, we know this uh, universality can, can break, right? And so when I uh, prove a theorem about this universality, so right now we were just working with real images and uh, this wasn't happening, but when we'll see a theorem about this, we'll see like there's an assumption to, to counteract the uh, the situation that you are referencing. <coughs> okay, so uh, in the uh, in the last part of the talk, I kind of want to tell you about a result um, uh, about trying to formalize. Oh, sorry, uh, about trying to formalize uh, this this empirical phenomenon. Uh, <coughs> so, so again, just to recall. What we're trying to understand is that often we see that the statistical properties of the inference tasks depend only on the singular values of our design matrix. The singular vectors are not important, provided they're not exceptional. And the goal is to sort of turn this heuristic into like a mathematical principle so that we can check when, when this is gonna hold and when this is not gonna hold. So when does this happen and when does it fail? And what exactly do we mean by the singular vectors being non-exceptional or generic? And so, uh, and so, what I uh, so I've worked on this uh, uh, for a bit, and what I'll tell you uh, about is sort of like the, uh, the last result uh, I got uh, with my postdoc advisors, uh, Yuelu and Subrata Sen. And I'll also point you to um, uh, concurrent work uh, by Wang Zhong and Fan, which is basically studying the same phenomenon. <coughs> okay, so. Uh, let me explain the setup for our result. So we decided to study this phenomenon in the context of the linear regression problem. So it's a simpler problem than the one I uh, uh, told you about. So here, what we, we assume a linear model on the measurements. So the measurements are x beta star, so x is again the design matrix, beta star is the unknown signal that we like to uh, recover, and uh, uh, we are corrupting the measurements by ID Gaussian noise. And we would like to study the universality properties of uh, regularized least square estimators. So these are estimators that minimize a cost function. So the cost function has two parts. The first is the sort of the sum of squares errors between the actual measurements and the fitted measurements if the unknown uh, signal was beta. Uh, and, uh, and then there's this regularization term uh, which sort of promotes uh, some a priori structure that we believe applies to the unknown signal beta. So for example, if we believe that the unknown signal beta star was sparse, maybe we would choose the regularizer to be lasso, 
but I should say that the theorem applies only if the regularizer is strongly convex. So it doesn't apply to lasso, but if you added a small amount of rich uh, penalty to lasso, then it would apply to lasso. Um, add in lasso plus rich, yeah. Um, okay, so is the, is the setup okay? Uh, and so we would like to understand when the spectral universality happened in the context of the performance of these regularized least square estimators. Um, so in, in, in precisely this setup, actually this uh, spectral universality phenomenon was observed in the work of Donohue and Tanner and a subsequent work of Monajimi et al. So just, just to explain what they observed again. So they, they looked at three different design matrices. Um, uh, and I'll explain, so these are spike sign design, random DCT design, and hard design. So these are three different design matrices. Uh, and I'll explain what they are. And what they were interested in uh, is trying to understand the performance of the lasso estimator uh, for these three different designs. So they, perf uh, they plotted the mean square error of the lasso estimator as you change the sparsity of the underlying signal um, uh, for these three different designs. And what they found was that basically these three different designs behave exactly the same in their simulations. And it's not just that the mean square error of the three designs was behaving the same, but if you plotted the empirical distribution of the estimator, basically it seemed like the distribution of the estimator was, was the same. Um, uh, and so what are these three designs? The first design was like a completely structure deterministic design. The first, uh, first block in that design was the identity matrix. The second block was the discrete cosine transform matrix. Uh, the other design that they looked at was a little bit random, so they uh, took a big DA discrete tra cosine transform matrix and randomly picked some of its rows. And that design, I have an MRI image next to it because that's the design that people doing MRI care about. Uh, and the HAR design is like a very random design. So the way it's constructed is that you first sample a uniformly random orthogonal matrix and then pick some of its rows. And what's really common between the three designs is that they have the same singular values. Uh, and so what Donu and Tanner uh, were seeing was basically an instance of the spectral universality that I told you about. And out of these three designs, uh, uh, there has been some work on analyzing the hard design uh, because it has some nice rotational invariance prop properties. So the two papers that I've written, they prove the results about the hard design. Um, uh, but uh, uh, we, quite, we don't know uh, how to understand the spike sign design or the random DCT design because they are much less random. And so if we could understand why spectral universality is happening or we could show that this, it's happening, so whatever results people have proved for the hard design would automatically transfer to the designs, to the less random designs. Okay. Uh, and I'll also quickly mention some prior work uh, on uh, universality. So if, if you consider a noiseless linear regression problem, so suppose there's no noise in your problem, and you look at the lasso estimator, then actually John and Tanner proved some of their universality observations. And this is like a great result which is really hard to beat in terms of the generality of the assumptions on the design. Uh, but uh, the catch is that uh, they proved this result for noiseless in a very special case. And actually the way they prove this result is that they exploit the fact that the lasso estimator is a solution of a linear program. Um, and um, uh, so uh, proving the universality boiled down to exploiting some re results in the theory of random polytopes. Um, but the proof breaks down as soon as you inject some noise into the problem, or if you go beyond the lasso estimator, um, uh, which cannot, be, uh, and to general regularized estimators, which cannot be computed using linear programming. So it doesn't really capture, so the reason why this isn't the end of the story is that because it, spectral universality is a very general phenomenon, and this result doesn't really capture the generality of it. Uh, and then there's really a long line of work, and we heard some talks about Gaussian universality. So, uh, so these results basically say that uh, if you have a highly random design, uh, they often behave like uh, Gaussian designs. So by highly random designs, I mean designs either with IID entries or designs with independent rows, but with possible correlations within the row. Um, and the nice thing about these results is that they're very broad. They apply to essentially very general problems. 
Uh, but unfortunately, Gaussian universality is not valid for these very structured designs that I'm talking about. So these designs just don't behave like Gaussian designs. So you, you can even see this in simulations uh, when the, where these designs don't follow Gaussian universality. Um, and then there is um, a different line of work uh, coming from communication systems and free probability where people have been trying to understand what's the eigenvalue distribution of matrices constructed by adding and subtracting, uh, adding and multiplying uh, matrices with generic eigenvectors. Um, uh, but maybe the catch here is that it's not really clear how to, gen to relate the uh, performance of the lasso estimate, for example, to the spectrum of a matrix. So that, that connection is not, not super clear. Okay, so let me tell you about the result that we proved. Um, uh, so, uh, so before I show you the result, this result is an asymptotic result in high dimensions. So I let P, which is the dimension of the signal of interest, go to infinity. Uh, and uh, so the, uh, the, the template of the result, so, so I'll first tell you the template of the result. So the result says that suppose th you have two designs, x1 and x2, um, uh, which are required to lie in the same universality class. And what this phrase, the same universality class, is a placeholder for three conditions uh, that I'll tell you in a moment. So these three, two designs have to satisfy a set of three conditions. And I'll explain these conditions in later slides. But suppose they satisfy these three conditions. And um, if you assume that your unknown parameter beta star is drawn IID from a uh, prior pi. So this would exclude bad priors which are correlated with your design, um, bad signals which are correlated with your design. And suppose you computed the uh, <coughs> regularized least square estimator on the first design and the second design. So beta hat one is the estimator you compute on design one, and beta hat two is the estimator you compute on design two. Uh, and so what the result will claim is that in high dimensions, the joint distribution of uh, the estimator on design one and the beta star is the same as the joint distribution of uh, uh, the estimator on design two and beta star. So beta star is the unknown signal that we were trying to estimate. And uh, the sense in which this approximate equality in distribution holds is that uh, if you pick any nice test function phi, which is a bivariate test function, and then you applied it to the co coordinates of the unknown signal, and the first estimator computed on design one versus you applied it on um, the unknown signal vector and the estimator computed on design two, and average them across the coordinates, then the difference between the two quantities would tend to zero in high dimensions. And really, you should think of phi as your favorite loss function. So for example, um, if you are interested in MSC, the mean square error, you should take phi as the square loss. And it would tell you that the mean square error of the, uh, the two problems are equivalent on the two different designs. Um, and I, uh, yeah, but there's, it's nothing special about the mean square error. You could pick other phi. Um, and I won't really have time to tell you much about the proof, but maybe for people who are experts, like the proof uh, at, at the heart of this result is sort of a universality result for approximate message passing. And once we have that, we can transfer the result uh, to uh, like a, uh, an iterative algorithm which can compute the regularized least square estimator. And because it, these, uh, so the iterative algorithm you use as a proximal method, and because proximal methods can compute arbitrary well approximations uh, to the uh, regularized least square es estimator, and so if we show that the uh, proximal method behaves universally, so must the regularized least square estimator. Yeah, so it's like a, yeah, like an algorithmic uh, approach that that we also saw in Marco's uh, talk. Uh, maybe, and I, what I want to spend the remaining time is telling you about the three conditions which I didn't quite specify. So the two designs for them to lie in the same universality class, they are supposed to satisfy a set of three conditions. Out of these three conditions, the first condition is quite natural. It just posits that x1 and x2 should have approximately the same singular values, which was one of the prerequisites in the uh, spectral universality heuristic. So it's not super interesting. So I'll tell you about the other two conditions. 
uh, uh, which are that x1 and x2 have generic singular vectors, so that will help clarify what we mean by generic. And I'll, the third condition is the sign invariance condition, and I'll tell you about it because it's sort of a, uh, I think there's a nice problem there that's left. Oh, am I doing on time? I think so. Oh. Okay, so, um, so let me tell you uh, what the, uh, 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 so what does it, so the, this condition is supposed to capture uh, the requirement that the design should have generic singular vectors. Um, and uh, so first I'll exp uh, tell you the statement mathematically and then I'll uh, tell you the intuition behind it. So what this condition posits is that if you look at the covariance matrix of your design and you raise it to any power k, it should look like a scalar multiple of the identity matrix. Uh, and the way you're, uh, is, uh, measuring your approximation error is in the entry-wise maximum difference between the two matrices. So this infinity norm is the entry-wise maximum difference between the two matrices. And you allow the approximation error of 1 over root p, where p is the dimension of the signal, and you can even allow uh, the, you, this polylog p is, it's typically hard to verify it with 1 over root p, so this, you can think of this polylog P as a slack factor, which will help you verify this condition more easily. <clears throat> um, okay, so what's the intuition behind this condition? So I kind of like to think about this using a thought experiment. Um, so, in, so this is a thought experiment designed to interpret what this condition is uh, enforcing. Uh, so in our thought experiment, um, uh, uh, the design that we have has the properties that if you look at the uh, covariance matrix of the design, and if you looked at its eigen decomposition, so the lambda i's are the eigenvalues and the ui's are the eigenvectors, then the lambda i's are randomly matched to the corresponding eigenvectors. So in our thought experiment, the uh, coupling between the eigenvectors and eigenvalues uh, of the covariance matrix of the design is given by a random permutation. And for this design, actually, this condition is quite easy to verify because uh, if you look at uh, the kth power uh, of the covariance matrix, using some, if the eigenvectors were delocalized, using some um, simple concentration uh, bounds, you can show that uh, entry-wise, this kth power of the covariance would concentrates to its expectation. And you can also compute its expectation exactly because of, by averaging over the random permutation and this expected value will be a scalar multiple of identity, which is exactly uh, what we are requiring in, 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 the, in the condition. And actually, even though this is like a thought experiment, it's not like a crazy thought experiment because many of the designs that uh, Donu and Tanner were looking at, they actually fit perfectly into this thought experiment. So when you're picking the rows of a DCT matrix randomly, uh, one way to pick rows of a uh, discrete cosine transform randomly is to shuffle the rows by a random permutation and then pick the first few rows. So that will uh, introduce a random permutation pi into the problem, and you can write the covariance matrix of this randomly row subsample DCT exactly in this form. Um, uh, but more generally, what these conditions are intended to capture is that even though you're, uh, it might not be true that you're, uh, the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of your uh, covariance matrix of the design are randomly coupled, but they, when they satisfy these conditions, what these conditions pick up on are um, sort of approximate decoupling of the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. And uh, the one thing that we like about these conditions is that we were able to verify them for all examples uh, where uh, monogamy at all had observed uh, universality, and they were quite simple to verify in all of their examples. Uh, okay, so uh, let me tell you about the last condition. So before I tell you about the last condition, let me first begin by saying without this condition, we know that universality can fail. Without a third condition, we know universality can fail. Um, so in this plot, again, I'm looking at the three designs that I told you about, that Donovan and Tanner were looking at, and they observed that the performance of, uh, the mean square error of the last estimator was the same for these three designs. But here, uh, what I didn't tell you that is that the, the way they were sampling their unknown signal was from an IID prior, which was symmetric about the origin. Uh, but if you repeated the experiment with a 
prior, which was not symmetric, uh, you start to see breakdown of universality. And this was also observed in this paper by Munajumi et al. So I have a quote from their paper. And so to bypass these, uh, these exceptions to universality, what we require is that the design matrix X is constructed, the way it's constructed is that you take a deterministic matrix, and J can be an arbitrary deterministic matrix, but you randomly sign the uh, columns of that matrix. And the reason that we require this is because without this, we know that universality can fail. So it's not going to be satisfied by these three deterministic design, by some of these designs. Um, and the reason is because these designs sometimes don't exhibit universality, but as long as you randomly sign their columns, they would satisfy all the conditions that we've imposed. And what I would like to emphasize is that that's the only source of randomness in the design matrix, which is like much less than what was known uh, in prior work. And in some situations, you can get rid of the sign, uh, signing assumption if there's some sign symmetry in the problem. And I think a nice problem here is to sort of identify a deterministic condition that replaces the sign invariance condition. So we kind of think of it as a placeholder for a condition that we are not able to get at right now. Uh, OK. And I think I'll do this here. That, that's the summary. Uh, OK. 